search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise The treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together Hey church family, good morning. Pastor Jason here. It is so great to see you again this week. We've been praying for you all week long, especially as we've been going through our chronological Bible study. It is my hope and prayer that you are reading the Bible with us every day. And my prayer for you is that God will use it in a powerful way to speak into your life, change you so that you become more and more like his son. Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that today is small group preview day and so we have brand new small groups starting for the spring semester. You can find the information about those on our social media pages and also on our website. We would love for you to be a part of a small group because small group is where church feels like family. 
Small group is where we grow. Small group is where we connect and care for each other. And we would love for you to be a part of one of our small groups here. Hey, let's pray together and then let's jump in to God's word this morning. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to spend time in your word. Thank you, God, that no matter where people are at right now, whether they're at home or in a hospital bed, whether they're traveling for leisure and vacation or for work, God, your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts and lives. And Father, that's what I pray for each and every person today that can hear the sound of my voice. Father, would you, God, speak through me with the words that come from my lips come directly from you today. We love you, Jesus. And Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. If this is your first time with us, we are going through the Bible together as a church family chronologically. It's our hope that we will read the whole Bible in one year together. Now, if you're just now joining us, you haven't started, it is never too late to start reading God's Word. And we would love to give you some resources to do that. Do not hesitate to reach out. and We'd be happy to send you a free notebook to help you as you read through God's Word this year. We're also taking the 52 Sundays of the year and looking at 52 major Bible stories in the order that they happen. We're unpacking those to see how God uses them to speak directly to our lives and to change us. And last week we looked at the tragic story of Cain and Abel. After having his gift, his offering rejected by God, Cain murdered, he killed his brother Abel in a jealous act of anger. We asked ourselves three self-reflective questions. Am I giving God my best? Am I controlling my anger? And do I have the right attitude? And today as we continue in Genesis chapter 6, we're going to look at the life of Noah, a farmer turned boat builder, a farmer turned prophet, who was the only true follower of God who was left in his generation. The Bible says that God saw that the human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil from morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race. It broke his heart. So God said, I'll rid my ruined creation, make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes, bugs, birds, the works. I'm sorry I made them, but Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. So this is the story of Noah. Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. As far as God was concerned, the earth had become like a sewer. There was violence everywhere. God took one look and saw how bad it was. Everyone corrupt and corrupting. Life itself corrupt to the core. God said to Noah, it's all over. This is the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere and I'm making a clean sweep. So build yourself a ship from teak wood. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch inside and out. Make it 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Build a roof for it and put a window 18 inches from the top. Put in a door on the side of the ship and make three decks, lower, middle, and upper. I'm going to bring a flood on the earth that will destroy everything alive under heaven. There will be total destruction. But I'm going to establish a covenant with you. You'll board the ship. Your sons, your wife, your sons' wives will come on board with you. You are also to take two of each living creature, a male and female, on board the ship to preserve their lives with you. Two of every species of bird, mammal, and reptile. Two of everything so as to preserve their lives along with yours. Also, get all the food that you'll need and store it up for you and them. Noah did everything God commanded him to do. Now, Noah may be known for building a big boat that we call an ark, but the truth is this. Noah not only built a big boat, he trusted in his big God. Noah is a 10th generation descendant of Adam. He was 600 years old when God flooded the earth. So he could have been anywhere from 480 to 500 years old when God called him to build the boat. I don't know about you, but I would have been thinking, hey God, could you not have asked me this a little bit earlier in life, right? Friends, we always want God to do things sooner. But sooner is not always the best. And ultimately, God wants what's best for you. 
Sometimes we wonder why God hasn't done certain things in our lives yet. And here's the reality. God may be waiting until you are ready to fully trust Him in order to build something you never dreamed you could build. Not only does God's way work, friends, but God's timing is perfect. So let's unpack this story verse by verse. And I want to show you some lessons today that we can learn from Noah's life. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed this earlier, but Noah's story really begins at a low point in human history. Genesis 6, 5 says this, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and He saw everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Move down to verses 11 through 13. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all of this corruption in the world for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, the first thing that we see is this. The problem is always sin. The problem is always sin. I know we don't like to talk about sin. I know that's not popular in our culture today, but the problem is always sin. It always has been and it always will be. And God was expressing sorrow for what the people had done to themselves. Was he regretful he made humans? I don't think so. His response is more like a parent expressing sorrow over a rebellious child. God was sorry that people chose sin and death over a relationship with Him. Sin grieved God. And friends, today our sins break God's heart just as much as sin did in Noah's day. Even though he was far from perfect, Noah's life pleased God. The Bible says that Noah was righteous and blameless. Now, that doesn't mean he was perfect. That doesn't mean he was sinless. What it means is that he wholeheartedly loved and obeyed God. The scripture says he found favor with God. He walked step by step with God. And friends, like Noah, we live in a world full of evil, don't we? The important question is, am I influencing others or am I being influenced by the world? Am I being a light in the darkness, or am I allowing the darkness to snuff out the light? You see, I learned early on in leadership that when you walk in a room, you can be a thermostat or you can be a thermometer. What do thermometers do? Thermometers gauge the temperature of the room, but thermostats, thermostats control the temperature of the room. And in every room that you walk into, you have the opportunity just to gauge the room and see what's going on, or you can bring the light of Jesus in the room with you. You can bring light into the darkness. You can bring joy where there is bitterness. You can bring peace where there is stress. You have that ability because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. Are you being influenced by the world, or are you being an influencer for Jesus Christ? Now in the Bible, when God speaks to His people, He usually declares, directs, or defends. And in this story, it's no different. God declares that the problem with the world is wickedness and sin. Then God gives Noah instructions. He directs Noah, tells him what to do. Build a boat. It's going to be for your family. Two of each animal. Get enough food. All of those things. And then God defends or He protects Noah as he obeys. He's a part of that process. He's there with Noah. Let's keep going in verse 14. God said, build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 70 feet, 5 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. The second thing that we see from this story, if you're taking notes, is that God's plan always works. His plan always works. Now, let me tell you a personal story. I don't know about you. Maybe 
you're this way too. But growing up, I had plans for my life. I had a direction that I wanted to go. But God also had plans for my life. And so early on outside of high school and into college, I was actually studying political science and I moved into communications. I decided I wanted to work in politics and government and I did that for a little while, but it just wasn't fulfilling. And so I came back to North Alabama and worked in a defense corporation. It was a great organization to work for with incredible people. But again, I just did not feel fulfilled. And so I moved over to healthcare. And again, I loved what I got to do. Great people, a great mission and vision, great leadership, the opportunity to take care of people in the community and make a difference. But even as I was doing that, as rewarding as it was, it just was not fulfilling. And it wasn't until I went on a mission trip to Nicaragua years ago that I realized maybe God was doing something different. Maybe God was doing something unique in my heart, in my spirit. Maybe God was doing something unique with my calling. And people began to speak into me and ask me the question, Jason, have you ever thought about ministry? And I really hadn't. And so the more I prayed and the more I sought advice and wisdom from mentors in my life, I realized this may be the direction that God is calling me to go. His plans for my life included ministry. Now, I'm one of those people that have just felt called by God to serve. There are some people that are called into children's ministry. There are some people that are called into student ministry or called to be a senior pastor. And throughout the whole process, I've just tried to listen to God. And depending on the season of my life that He had me in, that's just what I've done. If in this season, this is what He has called me to do, I've tried to be obedient. I've tried to listen and obey. And so when God called me to be a senior pastor, I really thought he was kidding. That was not something that I ever saw in myself. Planting a church from scratch, pastoring and leading a congregation, a family by choice. But I'm so glad that I listened to God's voice. I'm so glad that I did things God's way. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Have I always done exactly what he's told me to do? No. Have I always heard his voice correctly? No. With all my heart, I have tried to follow him. I've tried to walk step by step with him just like Noah did. And it's been rewarding and it's been fulfilling. And it's been amazing to see what God has done. Because ultimately, it's been all God. His plan works. I love what Proverbs 19, 21 says. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Now, throughout the scripture, we see some characteristics of God's plan. I think we have to be careful when we talk about God's plan for our life, right? Because many times we think God's plan is 10 years from now, 15 years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. But the reality is, is God has a plan for your life in this moment. God has a plan for your life 15 minutes from now when you go to the grocery store or when you go to work tomorrow. God has a plan each and every day. So it is incumbent upon us to get up every morning and say something to the effect of, Holy Spirit, will you lead and guide me today? I'm listening. I'm aware of your presence in my life. And I want to do what you've called me to do. God's purpose is in every moment of every day thing. But what we see in the scripture, there are some characteristics. There are some themes around God's plan. And one of the things we see is that God's plan is better than our plan. It's better. In fact, the scripture says that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We cannot even begin to comprehend the thoughts of God. We cannot even begin to imagine what he wants with our lives. Now, we may not understand God's plan. We may not even like God's plan. But His way is always better. And usually it's easier to see that when we're looking back throughout our past rather than when we're trying to look into the future. We also see a characteristics of God's plan that God's plan always aligns with His character. God's plan aligns with His character. He will never call you to do something that is contrary to His Word. And so if there's someone in your life and 
they're walking into sin. They're doing something that we know is wrong in God's word. And they say, well, God told me I could do it or God's called me to do that. We know that that's not the true calling of God because God's call, God's plan is not going to contradict his character. It's not going to contradict what he's already said in his word. We also see that God's plan preserves your future. God's plan preserves your future. Paul said it this way in Philippians 1.6. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue His work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. God's plan for you is to preserve your future. And lastly, God's plan requires that you act. God's plan requires that you act In many cases, God's plan doesn't just happen in our life. We have to take a step towards God. We have to take that act of obedience. God's plans don't just happen. They must be found and followed. So I would encourage you this morning, if you've never thought about God's plan and purpose for your life, or maybe you don't understand what that is, spend time trying to find that plan. And if we can help you, it would be our honor and our privilege to help you, to resource you, to help you find out what God has for you while you're on this earth. It has to be found and followed. But a major part of God's plan is embracing the process. Sometimes God done things immediately. There's an experience that happens. There's a miracle that happens. There's a door that that opens that you just weren't expecting or a door that shuts that you just didn't think was going to happen. Sometimes his plan happens in moments. But most of the time, friends, God's plan happens as a process. And you can't get frustrated with that because process can take time, right? Process can be slow. And we have to be patient. We cannot get impatient with God, understanding that really time means nothing. That God is beyond time. And the process here can take time. The process can be uncomfortable. Sometimes the plan, sometimes the process that we have to walk through, it can be uncomfortable. But what I found is those moments in my life, friends, when I was stretched, those are the moments where God moved the most. Those are the moments where I grew closer to Him and learned the most. The process sometimes can be discouraging because not everything that happens to us is going to be good in our eyes. Not everything that happens to us are going to be things that we are happy about. And sometimes that can be discouraging. Or if it doesn't happen at a pace that we want to see it, that can be discouraging. But even in God's Word, we see moments where God sent angels to minister to to spiritual giants like Elijah. We see moments where angels ministered to Jesus. And we see moments with people in the Scriptures like David where he encouraged himself in the Lord when he was in a discouraging circumstance. We also have to understand that the process... Friends, it might be hard work. You think about what God called Noah to do. Noah's boat was the length of one and a half football fields. It was as high as a four-story building. God's burden may be light. It is light, but the work can be hard. But God's process always leads to fulfillment. It leads to a fulfilling life. It leads to a life, friends, without regret. And the process is the bridge between the plan of God and the promises of God coming into reality in our life. For Noah, I'm sure there were plenty of moments that he could have given up on the process. There were probably plenty of moments where he didn't want to build the boat. There were probably plenty of moments where it was too hard, plenty of moments where he may even have doubted himself. But thank goodness he didn't because Noah's act of obedience saved the lives of his family and it gave us a future. Never underestimate the power of one act of obedience and what it can do in our lives and in this world. Genesis 9 verses 1 through 3. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, all the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, all the small animals that scurry along the ground and all the fish in the sea. 
will look on you with fear and terror. I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for food, just as I have given you grain and vegetables. The third thing that we walk away with from this story, if you're taking notes, is that God's plan is a pathway to His promises. His plan, His route, His journey for your life is a pathway into His promises. God's plan, if followed, allows us to experience the promises of God. Because Noah had an ear to hear the voice of God. And because he obeyed God completely, the end result was Noah experiencing God's promises. I love this verse from Nahum 1.7. The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who who trust in Him. In Noah's story, one of God's promises was His protection. God told Noah that if he built the boat, he would spare his life and take care of his family. God kept the promise. God blessed Noah because Noah was obedient to the voice of God. And Noah would go on to multiply, to fill the earth. We also see that Noah gave, or God gave Noah a forever reminder of his covenant. God placed a rainbow in the sky to indicate, I'm making this promise that I will never flood the earth again. And I love this. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. He died at 950 years old. Oh my gosh, what a life that he got to live. All the things that he got to see. And now all of the people of the earth came from Noah's three sons. Noah's one yes to God had an incredible impact. So friends, my question to you today is what area of your life do you need to say yes to God? Maybe God is calling you to forgive someone and you need to say yes. Maybe God is calling you to restore a relationship and you need to say yes. Maybe God is calling you into an area of service and you need to say yes. Maybe God is calling you to join a small group and you need to say yes. Maybe God is calling you into ministry and you need to say yes. Maybe God is calling you to treat someone with love and kindness and you need to say yes. Maybe God is calling you to pray for someone, whatever it is. Listen, you can say yes to God. You can trust Him because His plan for you is better. Maybe you're watching, maybe you're listening right now and you need to say yes to God for the first time in your life. You have to understand that there's always punishment attached to sin. That's what we've really talked about these first few weeks together. We see that God hates sin. God does not want to be around sin. But there's punishment for sin. Adam and Eve were punished for sin. Cain and Abel were punished. Cain was punished for sin. And now we see the world being punished for sin in this story. But here's the beautiful truth. God loved you so much that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, God came to earth as the God-man Jesus Christ. And Jesus never did anything wrong. He never thought anything wrong. He never said anything wrong. Why? So that He could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Friends, we can either pay for our own sins or we can allow for what Jesus did on the cross to pay for our sins. Because that's just what Jesus did. He willingly died on a cross. He was sacrificed for us. He was sacrificed in our place. He spilt His blood so that you could be set free from sin and so that you could be forgiven of sin. But Jesus didn't stay dead. He came back to life again. He was resurrected to prove to everyone that He was exactly who He said He was. The Son of God in the flesh, the one with the ability to forgive sin. And he's at the right hand of God right now. And he is calling out to you. He is praying for you. And the Bible is clear. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be. But it's a decision that only you can make. And I want to give you that opportunity today. 
If you're watching, if you're listening, you're saying, Jason, I need to say yes to God. I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to follow Jesus with my life. I'm going to pray a prayer. If this prayer reflects what God is doing in your life, I invite you to pray it with me today. You can pray something like this. God, I've been going my own direction with my life and doing my own thing. Really, I've been trying to be my own God. And today I realize, God, I'm a sinner separated from you. And I need a Savior. I need to be saved. And I believe that that Savior is your Son, Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus died on a cross for me. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave. I believe that Jesus is still alive today. And God, I ask you, please forgive me and change me. Please apply what Jesus did on the cross to my life today. Jesus, you're my Lord now. And I want to follow you for the rest of my days. And Jesus, it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Friends, if that was you, congratulations. It's the greatest decision that you can make with your life to follow Jesus. The Bible says that heaven is celebrating the decision that you made. And I'm celebrating and people are celebrating along with heaven and celebrating along with you. But I want to ask you, please, don't turn this TV off. Don't turn this video off without letting us know of the decision that you made. You can go to our website right now and give me a name, an email address, just some way to reach out. We want to pray for you specifically by name. We want to send you some free resources that will help you grow in your faith. We want you to be everything God has called and created you to be. Friends, Jesus loves you and so do we. And if we can pray for you, if we can minister to you, serve you in any way, please do not hesitate to reach out to our staff. We would love to show you the love of Jesus. And if you don't have a church home, welcome home. We would love to be your church family, but listen, if you're not local to North Alabama and you live somewhere else in the country or even in the world and you'd like to help finding a church home, reach out to us. We will do everything we can to help you find a life-giving, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving church in your community. Thank you again to, for choosing to worship with us today. We cannot wait to see you next week. God bless you.